sickle. Bleeding saints and forest witches. The past unburied. The books unsealed. The old celebration returning. Hello and welcome to my study. Please uh, come in and have a seat. All the books around you here are those used to research our show and the individual to my right, along with uh, managing domestic duties, serves as our reader for any passages that will be uh, directly quoted from these sources. Her name is Mrs. Carswell. Hello. Well, we'll be uh, moving back to a more traditional and folkloric topic in this episode. But uh, before we get to that, we wanted to give some updates on the Bee Circus. Yes, the package has arrived. Indeed they did. And uh, for those who haven't uh, heard our last few episodes, uh, Mrs. Carswell's mother, uh, who is also a beekeeper. As was her mother before her. There are generations of us. Yeah, so I've been told. Anyway, her mother mailed the uh, boxes of her uncle's props, all the stuff that he once used in his bee circus. He kept trained bees and used to drive around the country giving shows. Yes, like a, a flea circus, but with bees. I've started training a few of my bees already. Alex, for instance, can climb a little tower now and ring a bell. Some of you heard that demonstrated last episode, and uh, you have another one you've been working with who can roll a little ball. Myra, yes. I think she's going to be a star. It's really rather remarkable. Thank you. I only have her pushing the ball at this point, but I'd like to train her to get on top of it, to roll it, like a lumberjack rolling a log in a river. Uncle Ebert had an Italian honeybee that could do that. Italians are known for their circus skills. That's the type of bee, not where he comes from. Hmm. Italian versus carniolan. Most of my hives are carniolans. Italian honeybees are very easygoing and simpler to work Uh, with, but they can be a little lazy. They're a happier, more outgoing bee. Carniolians are moodier and more artistic. They're from Slovenia. The the Slavic soul. I guess. So, when are we going to open that box? Now, if you like. Uh, We set aside one of the packages with the idea that we would uh, do a sort of uh, unboxing video, or audio in this case. It's something to let listeners share in the process as we... box cutter? Behind the box. Oh, I see. So, Mrs. Carswell is doing the honors right now, uh, opening things. Okay, let's see. Um, that, that's just packing, okay. Uh, I don't recognize this one. A little set of steps, it looks like. And some more balls. Bigger ones. Oh, oh, and those. Those are tethers on the spools. A a whole box of them. See the little bridles? I I guess on the edge. To uh, attach the bees? Yes. That won't be easy. Oh, this envelope seems to have more liability for us. Oh, let me see those. My lawyer will want those. He's not too thrilled about any of this. This one! This is the maypole! That might be a little hard and and a ramp, I I guess. And, oh, mm -hmm. oh, here's another ladder. Let's see. Colored cards. Not really sure about those. And, oh, that's the snowman! They would build a little snowman for the Christmas show. Once you get them rolling balls, they can build a little snowman. And they'd hang Christmas balls on the tree. And there was a big fat beetle in that one. Sometimes he used other insects, but not often. 
It was a Santa beetle with a little beard and cap. I got to see that one in person. There was a tiny tree with lights that went on at the end and a snowfall. Oh, that's charming. Ah, oh, these waivers. There's three whole pages dedicated to life support and comas. Okay, and um, well, this one, n not really sure. A stick and a base. Oh, I think it's the flagpole. Yes, here's the little pulley, I guess. So they would raise little flags with words on them. There was a whole bit where he'd ask a question and the bees would go into a huddle and discuss, then raise the flag with the answer. It'd be something like, shouldn't you all get back to working in the beehive? And the flag would say, no. Oh, a little comedy with rebellious bees. Nice. Sometimes the words were bad. The things he shouldn't have used in the school shows. He was banned in Tennessee. He seemed to have the most problems there. Actually, maybe it was Ohio. I think that's where he had the two twins stung at once. Two identical kids swelling up like identical tomatoes. People well, were taking pictures. Well, right, well, we'll have epinephrine on hand. If only that were the only thing. People are so unpredictable. Some people have no business attending a bee circus. What does that mean? You'd think if people see an event advertised as a bee circus, they wouldn't go if they had a bee phobia. Then you run out through a fire door and trigger the alarm, and of, of course the bees, they mm. panic. Well, I, I'm sure my lawyer can put some teeth in the wafers. What's worse anyway, a bee sting or... Falling from a fire mm, escape. Uh, okay, well, I think we want to move on now. Um, oh, so right. uh, let's just, uh, yeah, we'll start the show now. Uh, episode 73, The Dybbuk. Uh, I am your host, Al Reidenauer, and this show, Bone and Sickle, examines the intertwining of horror and folklore in a historical context. I started this show as a way to further explore this area of intersection after writing my book, The Krampus and the Old Dark Christmas. Bone and Sickle only exists thanks to the generosity of our Patreon donors, who receive monthly rewards, including short bonus episodes. I'll have uh, more on Patreon at the end of our show. What will happen when this box gets open? You can die. You can get killed. He will leave you alone. Am I in danger? Are my friends in danger? Why are you saying that? Stop saying that. You're listening to the latest hysteria over the Dybbuk box, ginned up for a July 2020 episode of Ghost Adventures, hosted by Zach Baggins, who, in 2016, bought the box for his haunted museum in Las Vegas. Opening the box supposedly released a dark figure into the building. It's in the museum. That something has been released from the Dybbuk box. It's all around it. And that just in time for the museum's summer reopening and Baggins 2021 series set in the museum. The word dibbuk, a Jewish term for lost souls who can possess a human host, would certainly have remained largely obscure but for an eBay listing placed in 2003 by Portland antique refinisher Kevin Manis. The ad described Manis purchasing the thing at an estate sale for an elderly Polish Holocaust survivor whose granddaughter explains that her bubby called it a dibbuk box and warned that it must never be opened Advice Manus ignores, opening it and finding inside a stone engraved with the word shalom in Hebrew, a penny, dried rosebud, lock of hair, goblet, and candlestick holder. Outwardly, it looks like a wine cabinet. After its opening, there's chaos in the antique shop, light bulbs exploding, strange odors from nowhere. Manus and others in his circle begin having identical recurrent nightmares and his mother suffers a stroke. Oh, a great story, especially for an eBay listing, but 
Unfortunately, Mattis has admitted that the whole thing's a work of fiction. Divics aren't normally confined to boxes. You won't even find the term Divic Box appearing anywhere before the 2003 listing. By 2019, Manus was admitting as much, offering a reward to anyone who could find such a thing mentioned anywhere, saying, I'll pay you $100,000 and tattoo your name on my forehead. It's taken some time for Manus to be this forthcoming. In 2004, when the box was sold to Jason Haxton, a director of a small Missouri museum dedicated to the uh, practice of osteopathy, Manus hinted that the whole thing was just a campfire tale. By 2011, Haxon had published a book, The Dybbuk Box, in which he waffles over the authenticity of the thing, settling mostly for the idea that the backstory was concocted, but that the box itself was the object of a genuine curse laid on it by Manus, whom he reinvents as a Kabbalistic magician. In any case, it's hard to keep a good story, or merchandising opportunity, down, and ahistorical Dybbuk boxes are definitely a thing, as evidenced by the proliferation of sites like DybbukBoxStore.com, or the book from just last year, Dybbuk Boxes and How to Make Them. And then there's the movies and paranormal shows like Ghost Adventures, for which Manus invented a whole new installment in the saga, elaborating on camera about ten boxes hidden around the globe that together were used to summon an evil spirit to fight the Nazis. Because the more Nazis you can put into any Jewish story, the better. A being so accommodating with their Dybbuk box tales, Manus and Haxton were hired as consultants for the... Based on a true story. 2012 horror film, The Possession. There aren't any seams. What does that mean? I think whoever made this didn't want anybody to open it. The box here is purchased by the daughter of a couple in the uh, process of divorce, something adding to the tension building up to the possession of the daughter by the Dybbuk. When the dad approaches members of the uh, local Hasidic community seeking help, He's rejected by the uh, older conservative men, but exorcist duties end up being performed by a younger and painfully hip Hasid, played by Matthew Miller, an actor-musician billing himself as a... Hasidic reggae superstar. Once a box is open, people die. There was also a uh, truly ridiculous Debbick film, Sans Box, from 2009, Unborn, which features Gary Oldman as a Jewish exorcist. For he will command his angels in your behalf to guide you in all your ways, that you will lift the stone, you will train upon the lion. And in the movie, there are also creepy twins, monster dogs, and supernatural Nazi experiments in a concentration camp because you've got to have the Nazis. A... Uh, truly good Dybbuk film that I won't say much about since I'd encourage listeners to see it for themselves is the 2015 Polish film Demon. It's wonderfully tense and sprinkled with black comedy and follows a more classic European storyline, especially in its setting around a wedding. The wedding the film Demon harkens back to is from a 1937 Polish film, The Dybbuk, in which the wedding celebration functions as a sort of expressionistically styled centerpiece. It's a classic of Yiddish language cinema and based on a play that had already experienced a tremendous success. The Dybbuk, or Between Two Worlds, is a 1914 play by Russian writer S. Ansky. Uh, S is for Simeon, but he only used the initial S, always. Uh, the story was inspired by Ansky's work as an ethnographer, collecting folk tales, documents, musical transcriptions, and even some early field recordings during a 1912 expedition through Jewish communities in Russia and uh, Eastern Europe. He wrote the play in Russian, but it was quickly translated into and 
most often performed in Yiddish. Translations and performances in dozens of languages quickly followed its 1920 premiere in Warsaw, a runaway success that drew such a steady stream of theatergoers that the nearest trolley stop was unofficially renamed Dybbuk. As a columnist writing for a Yiddish newspaper at the time quipped, Of every five Jews in the city, a dozen watched the Dybbuk. How could this be? It is not a play you attend merely once. The tale begins with a young student of Kabbalah, Hanan, turning up mysteriously dead shortly after the father of Leah, a woman he loved, announces her engagement to a groom preferred by the parents. On the day of the wedding, however, Leah becomes possessed by a dybbuk, the spirit of Hanan, whom we later learn met his end by dabbling with Kabbalistic magic in hopes of obtaining Leah. Before the dybbuk can be expelled, a revered holy man, Rabbi Samson, shares a revelation, a dream encounter he's had with the ghost of Nisan, uh, Hanan's father, who speaks of a broken marriage contract made with Zender, Leah's father, a vow that their infant children would marry. There follows a dramatic courtroom scene with Nisan's ghost pleading against Zender through Rabbi Samson and an even more dramatic exorcism of the uh, Dybbuk Hanan from Leah, who ultimately chooses death and union with Hanan over life and the wealthy groom she does not love. Popularized in the 20th century by the play, the word Dybbuk itself first comes into usage among the 17th century Ashkenazi German or Yiddish speaking Jews of Poland. It comes from a word meaning clinging. Of course, the notion of spirits clinging to or possessing humans had already appeared, for instance, in the biblical story of King Saul, whose violent mood swings are attributed to possession by an unclean spirit. But especially in Talmudic times, under Babylonian influence, such things were articulated in terms of demonology, not displaced human souls. It wasn't until the 13th century and the appearance of the Zohar, the foundational document of Kabbalism, that a philosophical basis was laid for the notion of Dybbuk possession. By the 16th century, Kabbalists like Chaim Vital had begun to discuss the distinctions of demonic versus Dybbuk possession. Here he enumerates the outward signs. The demon compels the person, and he moves spasmodically with his arms and legs, and emits white saliva from his mouth like horse broth. With a ghost, he feels pain and distress in his heart to the point of collapse. The story of Dybbuk, how it's known today, really begins with a 16th century explosion of incidents in Sfat, a uh, mountain city in northern Israel. After the expulsion of the Jews from Spain in 1492, influential Kabbalists from that country, where the Zohar had been written, settled in Sfat, joined by Jewish immigrants, primarily from Italy, but also Germany and North Africa. Even today, Sfat is so strongly associated with Kabbalah that tourism skews toward the mystic. There are, are bustling Kabbalah schools and libraries, art galleries advertising Kabbalistic art, and the tourist-friendly services of Rabbi Eliyahu K, who offers custom Kabbalistic decodings of clients' names based on where the letters appear in the Torah. But what really cements Svat's status as one of the four holiest cities of Judaism is the hillside cemetery which dominates the town as an ever-present backdrop. Among the thousands of graves and burial caves are many painted blue, those belonging to particularly revered sages or uh, tzaddikim, that is, righteous ones. Prayers offered at those graves are particularly redemptive. The cemetery represented a sort of still-living community of ghosts to the Kabbalists. Um, Rabbi Chaim Vital, whom we earlier heard differentiating the symptoms of possession by demons and dybbuks, wrote of his teacher, Sometimes he would gaze from a distance of 500 hands breadths at a particular grave, one among 20,000 others, and would see the soul of the dead there interred, standing upon the grave. To lie within this holy cemetery even provides a sort of 
spiritual head start, according to um, Fez-born Kabbalist Abraham Azule, writing in 1619. One who dies and is buried there, since it is a high place with air, purer and cleaner than any city in the land of Israel. His soul, therefore, speedily sails and flies to the cave of Machpelah in order to pass from there to the lower garden of Eden. The first and foremost figure in Svat's association with Kabbalah is Isaac Luria, nicknamed Ha'are, meaning the lion. Born in Jerusalem, he moved to Tzfat around 1569 and is chief among the sages buried in the town cemetery. Isaac Luria was that teacher Chaim Vital described perceiving spirits standing on graves. And just as uh, Socrates is only known through the writings of Plato, Luria's teachings were not written down by him but by Vital, recorded in a book called The Tree of Life, the foundational text of Lurianic Kabbalism, the most dominant school of Kabbalistic thought from the 16th century onward. Influenced by Luria, Svat became a sort of spiritual hothouse characterized by extremes of devotion, asceticism, and visionary experience. The expulsion of Jews from Spain had ratcheted up this uh, sense of apocalyptic fervor and was interpreted as a prophesied time of trial preceding the coming of two messiahs, events which in the Zohar were linked with the region of Galilee and nearby Mount Meron. Luria even suggested that he himself was Mashiach ben Yosef, the first of the two prophesied messiahs. There are more than a half dozen stories of Jivics in Sfat, more if you count another kind of spirit possession we'll get to later. We'll look at a couple of the more interesting ones, beginning with one overseen by a rabbi by the name of Elijah Falcon. His testimony was printed as a broadsheet in 1571, one entitled, A Great Event in the Holy Community of Svat. It begins, predictably, with a sort of preamble exhorting readers to greater devotion. Then, Falcon describes the scene in this holy community. I was amidst a great gathering, for there were over 100 people there, Torah scholars and heads of communities. Two men who knew the adjuration approached the woman so that the spirit within the woman would speak by means of the smoke, of fire, and sulfur that they would make enter her nostrils. She was like not for she would not push herself away, not even her head, from the fire nor from the smoke. The victim being... Like not. A phrase used several times in the narrative uh, seems to mean unconscious or semi-conscious. And uh, ritual fumigations with burning sulfur, among other things, are commonly used in these stories. And adjurations here would be verbal formulae serving to command the spirit. Um, adjurer is often used in the text where we might expect to see the word exorcist, a term that's not quite appropriate to divic discussions thanks to its uh, Catholic connotations. So uh, after some cajoling, the spirit speaks in a voice like the howl of a fierce lion without any movement of the tongue or opening of the lips. Later in the story, another sign of a foreign intelligence possessing the host is described, one that's taken as a standard sign of possession in Catholic exorcism stories. In addition to the uh, Aramaic that would have been spoken in Galilee at the time, the possessed woman speaks in Hebrew or... The holy language, and in the Arabic tongue, and in the tongue of Ishmael called Moorish. The woman did not know any of these languages. As with the Catholic rite, the banishing ritual always includes, as a preliminary, the command that the spirit identify itself. And after some resistance, the spirit does identify itself as that of Samuel Zarfati, providing further details about having died in Tripoli and having a son, information which the text implies is familiar to those gathered around. The Dybbuk is always the spirit of one who has sinned, 
The repudiation of the sin ideally would help serve the spirit to move on, and so the uh, adjurers or the rabbis demand to know what sins the spirit committed in life, and after some evasion... He answered and said that he had been a type of heretic, and that he had said that all religions are the same. And they asked him, And now, of what mind are you regarding this? And he responded like one, groaning with a voice, crying and raging, and said, I recognize that I sinned, transgressed, and wronged. The rabbis promised to pray for his soul, at the same time calling for him to flee to... A barren wilderness. They prepared to blow a shofar, a traditional element in these rites, at the blast of which is understood to shake loose the bonds by which the spirit clings to its victim. But before what would seem to be a sort of final dramatic step in the procedure, the spirit begins an odd sort of dickering with the rabbis, expressing a preference as to which rabbi should blow the shofar and which should offer prayers. The shofar is blown according to his preference, but the cagey spirit does not depart, further stalling with exchanges in which he expresses a dim view of his own son's potential. Then they said to him once again that he must depart, since they did for him according to his will. The spirit responded, Let a little time pass, then I will depart. They asked him, Do you want your son to pray for you or learn Torah? He said that it would not help at all, and that his son was unsuited to learn Torah. With the process somewhat derailed, one of the rabbis decides to gratify his personal curiosity, asking about the spirit's experience in the grave, about the beating in the grave, chibut ha kever, a beating with a fiery chain, Kabbalists believe to be meted out by Duma, the angel of the grave. Another rabbi argues that a dibbuk doesn't enter the grave, which the spirit takes the opportunity to correct. I entered on the day of my burial, and on that same night they removed me, and I did not enter again. They here presumably refers to Duma and angels assisting him. And from that very time, which was nearly three years ago, I have gone from mountain to mountain, from hill to hill. I did not find rest in any place, except that for a period of time I was in Shechem, where I entered into one woman, and they placed amulets upon her, so that I was unable to remain upon her further. He goes on to describe seeking refuge in a synagogue, but being set upon by protective spirits of departed sages who trample him. The rabbis continue their questioning. And they said to him, And how did you enter this woman? Is she not forbidden for you? He said, What can I do? For I found no rest anywhere than inside her. And if she is a married woman, have you no reservations about copulating with her? The spirit responded, And what of it? Her husband isn't here, but in Salonika. The sexual reference is surprising here, but not entirely. I don't know what words being translated as copulating, but from other hints we'll get to, it's clear there can be a sexual aspect to all this. The rabbis then doubled down, pushing the spirit to depart, to uh, exit through the woman's big toe, a uh, detail mentioned in a number of these cases. He then tried to deceive them into believing that he had departed the way that they told him. He raised her legs and lowered them one after the other with great speed time and again. And with those movements which he made with great strength, the cover that was upon her fell off her feet and thighs, and she revealed and humiliated herself for all to see. Again, this uh, sexual aspect. Uh, the woman is recovered out of modesty, and then she reaches to touch her feet with the fingers, as if he was pushing the spirit that was in the flesh through the nail by means of that touching. And then suddenly, she began to speak. She was sitting and saying, He has already left. The rabbis suspected still the spirit speaking, trying to deceive them. They bring the censer with burning sulfur close again, causing the woman to cry out to her grandmother and father-in-law, who are among the spectators. Why do you let them burn? 
burn me, for he has already left, and they do not leave me alone. Apparently, with a female host at least, there is another mode of exit available, not through the big toe, but through the vagina. Wondering if the spirit may have chosen this route, the rabbis recruit a female to discreetly examine the poor woman. And so it was done, and it became known that the spirit went out through that place and drew blood as he went out. And they placed the amulets upon her that were ready in the house, and she was assumed to have recovered. And they depart, believing the task complete, but only an hour later there's shouting in the streets about the possessed woman. And they rush back and... Saw her glazed eyes and labored breathing. And from these signs, they knew that he was still in her. Once again, the whole city, Jews and Turks, were coming one after the other to her to see the terrible thing that was astonishing to the eyes of every man. The rabbis debate whether the spirit actually left and returned, or perhaps never left. It suggested that the ambulance were ineffective because they were not written specifically in the victim's name. And they're eager to hush up the matter, fearing a mob may want to burn the woman. We don't hear more about adjurations or fumigations or debates with the Dybbuk as the broadsheet text comes to an abrupt and tragic end. Eight days later, the poor woman died because of the spirit that did not leave her. And they say that he choked her and went out with her soul. Our next tale of possession, told under the heading The Spirit in the Widow of Svat, is said to have taken place in 1572 and involves Chaim Vital wrangling with the Divok. The version we'll look at was recounted in a book published in Basel in 1628, Mysteries of Wisdom, by the uh, rabbi, doctor, and music theorist Yosef del Medigo. In this case, the Divok, having access to other worldly wisdom, as Dybbuk's do, has made its host, the widow, famous as a clairvoyant. A spirit entered one woman, a widow, and made her suffer very great and enormous suffering. Many people assembled about her and spoke with her, and the spirit replied to each and every one, making known the wounds of his heart and all of his needs for which he lacks. We learn that the spirit is that of an Egyptian who was a student of one of the lesser rabbis present. His death, we also later learn, came when his boat was sunk in the Nile. A request goes out to Isaac Luria to deal with the possession, but he can't come, so he sends his student, Chaim Vital. When Vital arrives, the woman turns away from him, refusing to face him, presumably because her sinful nature makes his holy presence overwhelming to look upon. Vital asks what sin has compelled the Divic spirit to wander and possess its victim. The spirit replied to him and said, I sinned with a married woman and fathered bastards. It has now been 25 years for me that I go wandering in the land, and they have given me no respite, even for an hour or a minute. The spirit reveals that the angel of the grave, along with three other angels of destruction, continue to beat him and follow him in his wanderings and are standing unseen even now in the room. Rabbi Vital queries the spirit, wanting to know why his narrative doesn't conform to the uh, traditional capitalist notion of what happens after death. That is, the soul lingers for 12 months in the grave and is punished by those angelic beatings and then moves on to Gehenna or hell for 12 months. But the Divic says he's compelled by different laws. He won't be released from his torments until each of the bastards he fathered expires and Israel is no longer defiled by their blood. After being beaten in the grave, he was slung to hell, but... As I fell there before the opening of Gehenna, there immediately came out of Gehenna one million souls of evildoers who are being judged in Gehenna. And all of them shouted against me and said to me, Depart, depart, man of blood! Depart from here, evildoer, tormentor of Israel! 
You are still unworthy of entering here, and you still have no permission to enter Gehenna. He wanders to the island of Hormuz, where his... Intention was to enter into the body of some Jew, perhaps to be saved from those blows, sufferings, and torments. Now, since those Jews who are evil and sinning to the Lord exceedingly, fornicating with Gentile women and other transgressions, I was not able to enter even one of them due to the many spirits of impurity that dwell in them and around them. For that reason I returned and went from the mountain to the hill and from hill to mountain until I came to the wilderness of Gaza. There. I found a pregnant doe. Due to my great suffering and the pain, I entered her body. It was tremendously painful for me, for the soul of a human being and the soul of a beast are not equal, for one walks upright and the other bent. Also, the soul of the beast is full of filth and is repulsive. It smells foul before the soul of a human being, and its food is not human food. I also had great pain from the fetus in her belly. The doe also had great pain because of me. Her belly swelled, and she ran into the mountains and in the rocks until her abdomen split, and she died. He then flees to a city in Palestine and surprisingly enters the body of a Kohen that is a member of the priestly caste and even more surprisingly is driven out not by fellow Jews but Muslim clerics summoned for help. After this he flees to Sfat and into the body he now occupies. We might assume that the uh, Palestinian priest that Dybbuk entered was uh, not as righteous as might be expected. And it is suggested in this narrative, though not every Divic text, that some fault for the possession lies with the host. In the case of the widow he now occupies, the spirit says he was only able to enter once she swore in frustration at being unable to get a fire started in the heart. What's more, the Divic informs Vital, the widow is skeptical of scriptural miracles, including the parting of the Red Sea by Moses. Addressing the woman directly, Rabbi Vital asks whether she has faith in the scriptures. She responded, Yes, Master, I believe in it all with perfect faith, and if I had at times a different view, I regret it. And she began to cry. And this clears the way for a proper banishing. And along the way, we learn why the left toe is the preferred mode of egress. Immediately, the rabbi declared a ban on the spirit to depart, and he decreed upon him that he not depart by way of any limb other than via the little toe of the left foot, because the reason is that from the limb that it departs, that limb is ruined and destroyed utterly. And the rabbi intoned the names that his teacher had transmitted to him, and immediately, the little toe swelled and became like a turnip, and the spirit left by that way. I want to return to the Dybbuk box for a moment to clarify a few things. It seems, if anything, Manus was inspired in his eBay storytelling by the uh, trope of a gin confined in a bottle, a motif originating in legends of Solomon keeping captured gin as slaves, uh, the only uh, practical rationale for keeping them around, I guess. However, in traditional Divic stories, the goal is to push the spirit forward on its prescribed course toward Gehenna, likely, or at least beyond the world of men. There would be no sense in bottlenecking the process by locking the Dybbuk in a wine cabinet, however nice the cabinet might be. All this is guided by the principle of rectification, what the Kabbalists called tikkun olam, literally repair of the world. While uh, modern schools of Judaism tend to only interpret this in terms of uh, acts of charity or social justice, in Kabbalistic thought it's part of a complex cosmology that involves restoring the sparks of divinity 
scattered at creation back into God. This principle has even been used to explain demon possession, as demons, having been made without a body, seek to possess humans to move up the chain of being. In Kabbalism, this principle of rectification was also associated with the idea of Gilgul, that is, reincarnation, or the transmigration of the soul from mineral up through earthly man to the holy man who can, in visions and after death, dwell with God. Uh, a soul that returns through various lifetimes to perfect itself is also called a Gilgul. In the case of a good or even saintly soul who has still not perfected itself, that is, uh, performed the required 613 mitzvahs, the soul can return to do so, uh, not as a Gilgul which occupies the body throughout the entire lifetime and is unaware of its past history, but as an Ibor, which is a sort of mirror of the Dibbuk, a good spirit that uh, temporarily occupies or displaces that of a living mortal. Uh, literally, the word means an impregnation. So another uh, sexual association to consider. And in order to encourage possession by an Ibor, the graves of holy men in Svat and elsewhere would be sought out in hopes that they might serve as a channel through which a saintly Ibor might pass. The Spanish Kabbalist Moses Ben Jacob Corovero, who took up residence in Sfat, describes the ritual. This matter was still done in Spain by great men who knew of it. They would dig a trench in the grave over the head of the dead. In it, they would pray for the benefit of the whole community, and they would cling soul to soul in solitary meditation. Chaim Vital records a number of interactions with the holy dead, including one in his spiritual autobiography, Book of Visions. In uh, that episode, as he enters the house of a fellow rabbi, a voice calls out to him. Welcome. Its source is a woman who has been possessed by an Ibor. When I came near to the girl, there was a veil over her face, and she was like a corpse. I said to him, from where do you know me? He said, Are you not the rabbi, Chaim, the Kabbalist? And I said to him, And who are you? I pleaded with him to tell me his name until he finally told me in a whisper, I am Yaakov Pisel. I died 35 years ago and descended to my place in paradise where I sat until now. There remained for me to repair one small thing, and I have now come to repair it. As it turns out, the good deed in question involves supporting Vital, naturally, in his uh, spiritual mission. And he's come a long way to do so. When he first returned to Earth, he had accidentally ended up in the body of a fish, which thankfully was eaten and able to transfer to a human. Well, we're nearly at the end of our show, but I have a little treat before we go. Perhaps you'd like to hear a Dybbuk speak, or growl, or something presumed to be a Dybbuk at least. It's uh, very rare, but from time to time reports come from Israel of a Dybbuk possession. At the uh, center of these cases, along with the possessed individual, is always a uh, Mekubal, or a miracle worker, a master of practical Kabbalah, that is applied magic. The Mechubal in question here is uh, Jerusalem Rabbi David Batsri, who runs Yeshiva HaShalom, a sort of seminary, I guess you'd say. In uh, April 1999, along with 30 other rabbis, Batsri performed a banishing rite on a 38-year-old widow who believed her late husband had taken over her body. Um, you can hear him questioning the spirit here. <laughs> I don't speak Hebrew, so I'm not sure what's being said, but speaking unknown languages is a sign of possession, after all. The uh, Dybbuk was said to have nearly choked the woman as it attempted to exit through her throat, but thankfully was redirected by Batsri to exit through her toe, of course. 
In 2010, Batshuayi performed a similar ritual in a subject who'd come all the way from Brazil. In both cases, throngs of curious would-be spectators crowded around the yeshiva, some even scaling the facade of the building to watch through windows. And both rituals were recorded and even broadcast locally on pirate radio. Batsui is the grandson of another Kabbalist, a miracle worker who was known for commanding spirits. He was also famous for crafting and writing about protective amulets and for turning his magical talents against the Nazis during World War II, but that's another story for another time, uh, actually for the Patreon blog. More recently, the Kabbalist Manashe Aman has been performing these ceremonies, I'll end with a rowdy example from 2019 in which you'll hear the Dybbuk cry out rather viciously. This is a bit into the process. Thus far, the subject has been seated and immobile, perhaps unconscious or in a trance. And all at once, he's up and then he's down, rolling on the floor in spasms. Along with uh, various prayers and psalms being chanted, you'll eventually hear one word uh, chanted over and over, which means go, go, go. It's time for us to... Go. I hope everyone's been enjoying our show and that you might have the opportunity to share episodes with friends or even better, to leave a review wherever you listen. Those do help us a lot. As I mentioned at the top of the show, these episodes only keep coming out because of the support of our lovely Patreon subscribers. When you donate, you're contributing towards the uh, more than 100 hours of work I end up putting into each episode. Uh, Pledge commitments begin at $1 and can be edited at any time. Those subscribing at the $4 level or higher receive a short extra episode in the marvelous and rare format. Uh, Other rewards include access to our Patreon blog, posting extra tidbits that almost made it into our episode, uh, downloads of show soundscapes, what you hear under the narration, uh, show scripts, my Krampus book, the Bone and Sickle Candle, and unique hand-packed mystery kits. I have a few new Patreon supporters to thank. C.T. Stahl, Ryan Calder, Melinda Lawson, and Jessica Barber. And I'd like to thank Darren Dumez for uh, upping his pledge. Also, uh, thanks again to our recent subscriber, uh, Jack Zients of JewishMonsterHunting.com for getting me started on Dybbuk research and pointing me to the uh, excellent books of uh, J.H. Chayas uh, from where I got the uh, translations we used. Uh, he has several out if you want to Google him. His last name is spelled C-H-A-J-E-S. Bone and Sickle is written and produced by me, Al Reidenauer. Mrs. Carswell is played by Sarah Chavez, whose projects and writing related to death and culture you can track at sarah-chavez.com. Thanks so much for listening. <laughs>